All right, everyone. So I want to talk to you guys again about uh, Renaissance Italy, basically making the point that those days weren't really as different from now that some of us may think. Some of us have this idea that in those days, people were more classy, they were more, I don't know, religious, more moral or, or something like that. And yes, uh, Christianity most definitely had uh, a much bigger influence on society in those days than it does in our own times. But nonetheless, nonetheless, evil was most definitely at work, as it always is. And even the Vatican was not immune to this. Uh, we sometimes will say, oh, yes, Vatican II, you know, it all goes back to Vatican II, all of the evils of the Vatican. Oh, goodness, my music is playing. Oh, gosh. That Evanescence music started playing. <laughs> anyway, uh, some people may think that, uh, you know, all of the the corruption in the Catholic Church or really a lot of the terrible masses and the just the, the, the playground circus uh, masses that we see in the Catholic Church today, people will say, well, that all goes back to Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II. Well, yeah, a lot of it does go back to Vatican II, but when we actually look at history in Christendom, and I know that sounded very trite, like, when we go back to history, but yeah, when we actually look to the history of Christendom, what we find is that the idea of synchronizing Christianity with paganism um, really goes back a long way. Uh, and that, that idea, that ideology of syncretism can be found in the late medieval period and also in the Renaissance era. Uh, when we read uh, Renaissance history, we may think, oh, you know, in those days, you know, people were so classy. This is Italy, right? So, like, everybody was, I don't know, eating pasta and, and eating gelato or, or something like that. And we may look back at that history and think that it's classy, but people living in those days really didn't think they were that classy. To them, their culture, the way that they lived, it was just life. It's kind of like when I uh, make Polish food. Sometimes I'm in the mood for pierogi. Yes, pierogi is really good. I mean, the dough, the way that it's, the way that it, it tastes, its texture, uh, when it's boiled and it's filled with potato and cheese. It's really, it's very, very delicious stuff. With some sour cream in the end, it's pretty delicious. Uh, once in a while, I'm making pierogi. Like I probably make pierogi maybe like two or three times a, a year. And to me, it's a cultural experience. To me, it's like, wow, this is Polish food. It's really good. You know, or I'll make borscht a few times a year or something like that. And to me, it's it's really good. It's kind of a cultural experience because I'm tasting the cuisine of another country. But for people who live in the countries where these dishes are eaten, um, it's just food. Like this is just a part of their society. Um, yeah, I, I've had a, a weird thought in my mind uh, within recent months, or really within, uh, probably since last year, when I started researching uh, Poland during the Second World War. And uh, basically, it goes something like this. Um, Polish food, Ukrainian food is pretty much the same thing. Uh, no, it's not. It, it, it basically is. There are differences, of course, but they're very similar. That's just, that's just settled with they're very similar. And the food is really good. Like, there's borscht, and the, the Polish people have this dish where they blitz beets with potato, and they serve it cold, and they have, you know, pierogi. And then in Ukraine, they have pierogi, but they have other... They got a similar thing where... I think the Russians also do this as well, where they stuff dough with meat, and they put it in the oven. I mean, they have all these dishes. And I'm always thinking... Not always thinking, but sometimes I think to myself when I'm looking at the very dark history that occurred in Poland during the 1940s in which Ukrainian fascists butchered around 100,000 Polish people. I think to myself, man, the people 
people who butchered human beings like they were farm animals, worse than farm animals, actually, uh, they were eating this food. And you would think that uh, a people who are eating such wonderful food, you you would think that they would have like a higher view of humanity because they're preparing all these dishes and they're focusing on making meals for their families. You would think they would have this more. You would think they would have more of like a collectivized view of of humanity, but they didn't. So that's the thing. Sometimes we look at past cultures and we think, oh, you know, they were it was it, it, they were so fascinating or they were so classy. But the reality is that those people to them. That was just life, right? The way that those people lived. Anyway, so today I was reading this this book, uh, Death in Florence by Paul Strathern. It's an entertaining read. And he talks about this war that took place in the early 1480s, right? Not the 1980s, right? The 1480s. Remember back in the 80s? Not the 1980s, 1480s. Man, we were really, really jamming to those Renaissance tunes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so there was a war between two very powerful city-states, uh, Venice and Ferrara. Ferrara and Venice, these were very, very influential, very powerful uh, cities. And they were at war with each other. And the Venetians were very expansionist. They wanted to expand their territory. And so... Um, the the leader of Ferrara, he was a duke, actually. His name was, and yes, I had to write all this down because I can't remember all this stuff. His name was Duke Ercole. Duke Ercole was married to the daughter of Ferrante, who was the king of Naples. And you may think, oh, Ferrante, that sounds Spanish. And it probably is because Naples does have a lot of Spanish influence in it. But, uh, you know, Italian and Spanish culture, they have so much overlap between between each other. But, yes, uh, the king of Naples, his name was Ferrante. And uh, Ferrante, um, uh, he was, of course, an ally to um, both uh, to Ferrara, but he was also an ally to Florence. And uh, Duke Ercole was at war with... Venice, and he asked for help from his father-in-law, Ferrante, the king of Naples. And uh, Ercole also asked for help from his other ally, Florence. And the leader of Florence, the very wealthy banker, Lorenzo de' Medici, requested help from his ally, Milan. And uh, the, uh, the troops of the allies were led by a man named Alfonso, who was the Duke of Calabria. All of this sounds so classy, right? Calabria, Ferrante, Alfonso, Ercole, Venice, oh, romance. Uh, but, but it, you see, that's the thing. Us English-speaking people, because it's not just Americans who think this way, right? English people speak think this way. Australians think this way. We think, oh, look, it's it Italy. Oh, Ferrante. Oh, so romantic. Oh, my God. Que romantic. Oh, Italian. Oh, my God. But in reality, those people were warring with each other. They were killing each other. Uh, in my last video, I talked about a war, a civil war that took place in Ferrara between uh, Ercole and one of and uh, a relative of, a relative of his named Nicolo, and literally they were the, the the two political factions were fighting with each other, and they would grab the women who belonged to the families of 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 the you know of the political factions that were warring, that were warring with each other. And they would just throw them to mobs, and the mobs would literally rape them in the middle of the street. It was horrific stuff, but again, these people had last names that we would consider romantic. Anyway, so, yeah, so there was this guy, Alfonso, who was the Duke of, uh, of, of Calabria. And Alfonso needed to cross through papal territory. Now, at this time, the papacy, the Vatican, was an ally to Venice, so Alfonso needed to cross through papal territory, which meant that he had to ask for permission from the Pope to cross his territory. And the Pope said, no. The Pope said, no, I will not allow you to cross my territory. So um, Alfonso crossed anyway. Uh, he battled it out with the Venetians, and uh, he lost. Well, actually, re rewind a little bit here. 
he 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 went into papal territory and then he had to fight papal uh, forces, papal soldiers, and the papal soldiers defeated uh, Alfonso and uh, the troops that he was leading. Ferrante was so upset. Ferrante, the king of Naples, he was so upset with the pope that he actually incited a revolt from the leading families, uh, from very uh, elite families, so, such as the Orsini family. Alfonso continued the fight against the Venetians. And uh, the head of the papal forces, his name was Girolamo Riario, he promised uh, to provide troops to the Venetians, but he did not uh, he did not uh, do what he promised that he was going to do. And eventually, Pope Sixtus IV began to fear the Venetians. And this is one thing that I found interesting. The Pope was supporting the Venetians against the Ferraris and against the, the Milanese and the, and the Calabrians and, of course, the Florentines, who were very powerful at the time, thanks to the Medici family. The Vatican was supporting the Venetians only to eventually fear the Venetians. Why did the Pope fear Venice? Because the Pope began to realize that the Venetians were going to continue to expand, to expand, to continue to take territory. And the Pope was worried that the Venetians would eventually begin to take papal territory. So the Pope... He, he cut off his alliance with Venice, and he joined the alliance with uh, Florence. And this alliance, like I said, it consisted of Calabria, Ferrara, Florence, Milan, and Naples. And the Pope uh, joined this alliance. So now it's kind of like World War II. After World War I, America says, oh, we'll support Germany. Yeah, of course, because, you know, communism is evil. But then America realizes, wait a second, this Germany is a Frankenstein that we created, and now we need to kill the, Frank the Frankenstein. We need to slay the monster that we helped build up. And uh, eventually, you know, the, the, there was a, a peace negotiation that was conducted. And supposedly they were all going to be friends. But behind the curtains, behind the curtains, there were secret alliances, secret agreements being made. So, for example, uh, Girolamo Riario, who was the, the head of the papal forces, he convinced Alfonso of Calabria to give Ferrari's territory to the Vatican. And also, Ludovico Sforza, who was the head of Milan, had entered a secret alliance with Venice. Reading all of this, all of this sounds strangely modern. Like, peace treaties, and behind the peace treaty, you have secret alliances, secret dealings being done. And that's the thing, you know, that's why I, I don't understand how people can put so much trust on treaties and peace treaties. It's like before Germany and before Germany invaded Poland in the 1930s, Germany and Poland had an agreement of of no aggression. They had a non-aggression agreement and that agreement went out the window. Why? Because the Germans for decades wanted to take control of Poland. Even during the First World War, the Germans had this uh, envisioning of removing Polish people from certain territories that the Germans believed belonged to them. And so in World War II, they basically just brought their envisioning into, into fruition. They materialized what they wanted to do all along, and that was to exterminate the Poles and take territory uh, from Polish people. Um, U Ukrainians and Poles were very friendly with each other for the most part before the Ukrainian fascists started butchering Polish people. And one thing, if you read uh, testimonies of Polish people, or if you listen to testimonies of Polish people who survived those massacres, those anti-Polish uh, pogroms that were done by Ukrainian nationalists, one of the things that you will see come again and again and again, or one of the things that you will hear being said again and again is we were shocked because we were being butchered by our neighbors. We were shocked because the Ukrainians who were butchering us were our neighbors. So 
peace treaties can be done. They may be honored for a, a certain amount of time, but that doesn't make them definite. It doesn't make them ingrained in stone. Treaties are broken. And behind the curtains of those peace negotiations or those treaties are conspiracies to take territory, plots to, to stab their neighbors, plots to invade their neighbors, to even massacre or exterminate their neighbors. So looking at this history of, of Italy, I'm amazed at how modern it is. Even though this was in the 1480s, ain't nothing changed. I mean, yes, technology, of course, has changed. I mean, look at me. I'm in my room talking to you guys from a computer. But human nature doesn't really change all that much. And and what has greatly changed is our technology. And our technology is really only a means by which we demonstrate and exhibit our human behavior. Um, I want to read to you guys an excerpt from this book because part of part of the the of the book that I read talks about how in this time period in the 1480s there began a movement of focusing more on paganism than Christianity. So for example, the book talks about this very famous artist, one of the most famous artists in Europe's history, Botticelli. Botticelli was the guy who uh, adorned the Sistine Chapel of the Pope. Pope Sixtus the Fourth, and so he adorned the the Pope's sixteen or Sistine Chapel, and then after he was done, he returned to Florence, and he joined the elite circle of artists and intellectuals at the Palazzo Medici. The Palazzo Medici was where all of these intellectuals would gather together, and they would talk about art and whatever. And uh, it says here that Botticelli once more renewed his contact with the intellectual circle associated with the Palazzo Medici, where he was particularly influenced by the platonic idealism of the philosopher Ficino and the humanism of the poet Poliziano. As a result, Botticelli's work underwent a spectacular transformation. Instead of religious scenes, he began to depict pagan subjects from classical mythology. Typical of these was his Pallas and the Centaur, which depicts the goddess Pallas Athena grasping the hair of the mythical half-man, half-horse, apparently restraining the repentant centaur. The scene is illustrative of how the Renaissance was beginning to emerge from its slavish mimicking of classical learning into an originality of its own. There is no classical legend involving Pallas Athena and a centaur, but Botticelli has used these two figures to suggest an encounter between wisdom, Pallas Athena, and lust in the form of the half-man, half-beast. And before that, the book says, classical knowledge and pre-Christian ideas had by this stage begun to stimulate an entirely new spirit of inquiry and consequent originality. So here we are in the 1480s, and people are mixing paganism with Christianity. People are beginning to put more emphasis on the Greco-Roman paganism, on paganism, pre-Christian religion. So here we have humans going basically into neo-paganism, or in those days it would be neo, right? It would be new. And they would have been getting into almost something like Wicca. Not exactly. I mean, they, I mean... Yeah, Wicca is a little bit more like New Agey stuff. But in those days, it was going, it was, there was a movement that wanted to pursue um, a glorification of the pagan past. And so you already see the devil at work. And it, it doesn't really matter. People think, oh, it's, it was the 1480s, you know, people were more Christian. And I guess some people live in this fantasy land that everything was great until Vatican II. But in Christendom, there was this movement that wanted to sort of blend in paganism with Christianity, and there was this very strange idealism towards paganism. So yeah, that's the video on this particular subject. You guys just heard some theology. God bless.